Thanks everyone. So my name is Moira Minahan. I'm a development team lead in the media and entertainment division at Autodesk in Toronto, Canada. And today I'm here to talk a bit about how we ported the Maya application to Qt. Um, I'll explain a little bit about why we chose Qt and the benefits that we got from it. And hopefully there'll be time for a very short demo at the end. So. Um, so a little bit about Maya. It's really good that uh, Ken gave his talk this morning because that kind of sets the context for where the Maya fits in. So it kind of sits in the middle of the entertainment pipeline for our, our customers. Um, so people do like character rigging, special effects, um, that, that type of thing, and you know animation with it. And this is a, an example of a firework that someone in my team created, like. A, sort of canned effect that we just recently added. Um, so why did we want to update Maya? So this is, this is kind of the old Maya, and it was developed like in the mid-90s, originally on IRIX, and then it was ported to Windows and Linux and Mac 32. Um, you can tell it was kind of shown its age just by the kind of style of the widgets. And like for the developers, um, it was extremely difficult to develop any new widgets that they wanted to use or any new controls or windows because if they wanted to develop something new, they'd have to do it on four platforms basically. So by the time they had done that, the development year would be over and you know they wouldn't actually get to do their feature. Um, so one of the motivations that we had for updating um, to Qt was actually Mac64 because it was judged that to do the Mac64 port, which our customers really wanted, would be it would be about the same amount of work to port to Qt. So um, that was yeah, like, like surprising but true. So um, and just we wanted to kind of update the look of the application. Like our customers are very visual people, so you know, we wanted to kind of make it look better. So um, so how did we go about choosing a new toolkit? Well, you know, like I say, cross-platform was an absolute must. Um, we wanted something with a proven track record. Like we didn't want to go with something that was really experimental. Um, we knew that we needed more flexibility, like because we like to do, shall we say, unusual UI. Um, it's not you know, everyday application. Um, you know, the things our customers do are kind of really like cutting edge, and the the UI tools that they need have to be the same. So, um, for us, it was going to be less maintenance costs because we were. Even to do like some really routine UI work, it was becoming like a burden to maintain um, the the UI on on all these different platforms, and um, people just wanted that headache to to be gone, basically. Um, so we also wanted a solution that we would have some control over, and that was one of the appeals of Qt was that we we knew that if we absolutely needed to, we could kind of get under the covers and change the the source code so um, I'll talk a bit more about that and in, in the slides so so with QT um, pretty quickly emerged as kind of you know the the main alternative that we were looking at it fit all of the criteria that I mentioned it was a mature stable technology which was important and also really important was that some of our customers were already using it by this time and were telling us that they liked it and um, that, was, that was a big factor in the decision actually. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about the uh, Maya UI architecture. So the way that the Maya architecture is put together is we have something called extension layer, which basically implements the UI on the different platforms. And we have like a, a scripted 
command-based UI based on the MEL language, which is like um, unique, unique to Maya. It stands for Maya Embedded Language. Um, later on, Python came along, so we kind of made Python bindings for the, the same set of commands. Um, and this, this is sort of an example of what some of the, the code looks like. So it was, because we started on IRIX, it was very, like the concepts of the UI were very sort of motify. Um, so you had forms and attachments and um, that's kind of reflected in the, in the scripting language. You can see like um, the sort of attach, attach form and you know everything's kind of laid out as this is in relation to this side of the form and it's it completely different to the way it's done in QT, sort of very kind of old school. Um, so this was, this was kind of mid-90s mid kind of thinking on, on how to lay out your UI. Um, so some of the challenges that we faced with, with doing the port, um, you know, we had, we have like hundreds of, of UI scripts and we couldn't kind of go through and change all of those scripts. And not only that, like our customers have hundreds and, you know, maybe thousands of UI scripts too. So, you know, they're sort of out there in the world and they need to continue to work. So, so the approach we took was to kind of have the same set of commands and people can, um, but change the underlying implementation to use Qt instead. So people can continue to use all the same scripts and they, they just have to work. So um, we did tweak a few things in our own code in the end, um, but it was more because we kind of got into these kind of crazy platform differences and actually we were sort of able to remove some of that nonsense in the end, so that was quite good. Um, so Maya is a very, very large application. Um, and if I get to do the demo at the end, you'll, you'll kind of see that. Um, so I've made some kind of stats from it. Like we have um, about 100 UI commands that we had to re-implement using Qt. So it's like, you know, widgets and layouts to do different things, tab layouts. And we also have some kind of custom editors, like for example, for editing animation curves, that kind of thing. Uh, Altogether, there's about 300 dialogues and editors in the program. Uh, 2,500 icons, which we know because we replaced every single one of them with, uh, with this version, and our graphic designer actually kept track of, of how many there were. So, um, about, we have more than 600,000 lines of MEL code, which is the, the UI like scripting code. I did a, a count of the number of widgets that we have just on startup, and it was like over 2,000. If you bring up all of the windows, it gets it's like over 10,000. If you loaded some scene data, it would probably be even more. Like so, it gets kind of crazy. Um, I'd be really interested to know if anyone else has kind of instrumented the app to see how many widgets it has, and if there's any other apps out there that have that have more widgets than we do. Um, so, so that's kind of a challenge actually, like in terms of, you know, keeping performance up. Um, and also another aspect that was sort of a challenge for us was Maya has some really unique UI, like we have um, marking menus, which I don't know if everyone's familiar with them, but they're like uh, radial menus that you can use um, to gesture. Our users like to drive the interface, like it has a lot of com different commands in it and they like to drive it like really fast. So a lot of times they're using marking menus on the hotbox to do that and just doing like many, many different commands. Um, and they're like, when you see them working, they're like really, you know, you can't even figure out which, which commands they're using half the time. You're kind of like, slow down, like, you know, show me this properly, like, um, Another thing we did was, um, like you'll see in Maya, like we have many, many menus in our application and almost every single one has a set of options associated with it. So we had to do 
like we have these i don't know if you can see it in this picture because it's really small like in in this menu item it has like a little square and that brings up like a, a set of options associated with that menu so that was that was one of our first challenges when we went to qt was to to implement that that part um and we ended up doing like some some custom menu drawing like to get that to work so that was kind of a relief because we were going to we were trying to figure out all these workarounds for how we would do without that but um so basically like i said we re-implemented all the the U, ui commands and the custom editors um it was quite interesting to try and reconcile the difference between like the old motif kind of layout concepts and like QT's concept of how to lay things out is very dynamic, um, but our existing commands are very are kind of based on the old concept. So there was like a little bit of um, reconciling to do with that, and in some cases we actually um, incorp we made some new commands like flow layout to kind of help ease the transition a bit. Um, in certain areas, like to to make things work a bit better, um, and we, in addition, we had to migrate all the event handling to the Qt framework. Um, and the picture here is just my what I call my spreadsheet from hell, which is just like a little snapshot of the the hundred hundred commands that we had to re-implement um, to do the port. Uh, so timeline wise, um, so I think people, like I wasn't involved in the initial investigations of the project, I think it was probably around like 2004 or something that people started thinking about updating the UI technology. Um, 2006 got a little bit more serious, um, more investigations and like one person did some prototyping. We also had someone came from, well, it was then Troll Tech at the time. And we got all the UI people in the company in a room and kind of interrogated uh, the developer from, from QT and said, well, how would we do this crazy thing that we're doing? And, you know, basically everything checked out. So then 2010, uh, 2007 rather was when I got involved in the project. And I had like a, a small team of two to three developers. Um, we started on the port for real, like sort of in the, the latter half of 2007. Um, about a year later, so we originally started working like a development branch. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the development team was still working on the Maya features in, in the main line. So we were like merging all their new code. Yeah. It was it was kind of crazy, uh, into into our branch and you know kind of I mean it's a very large source tree so that was that was kind of a challenge. Um, then I think it was like August two thousand eight, we went back the other way and said okay our changes are solid enough now that we'll we can kind of go back and bring our changes back to Maya and kind of like bring everything together. Uh, 2009, we just threw more people into into the port, and uh, at that point, my job was kind of plate spinning, like making sure everyone was kind of, you know, keeping busy, and you know, there was just like so much to do. Um, and then March 2010, we shipped the first version of Maya based on Qt, so that's Maya 2011. And we, we ended up using uh, Qt453 for that. So even though, um, even though 4.6 came out in, in the December, it was like a bit late for us by then because we were, we were kind of frozen at that point. Um, so this is kind of the, the cast of thousands in, in order of appearance. So Sergey Bianov, I know some people here have met him. Um, he was the lead architect on the, the project. Um, and so, so what went well with the port? Um, like we were very pleased with the the Qt API. Um, like the documentation was like just excellent, like really high standards. Um, for most of the widgets, it was it was kind of really obvious what we had to do. So 
um, aside from the issues with kind of the the motif layout concepts, which we kind of struggled with a bit. For most widget implementation, it was just, it was dead obvious what to do. So that was really good. And most of the QT widgets have like a really high level of built-in functionality. So some of the existing widgets got, you know, automatically got more support. So that was, that was really, really good. Um, and we had really, really good support from Troll Tech, now Nokia. Um, and we were really lucky because we had some kind of individual attention there, so that was, that was fantastic. Um, so, like the list of one, what went well is kind of a bit shorter than the list of what was more challenging. But, uh, so, the, the marking menus and the hot box that we have were a bit of a challenge on different platforms um, because our users are using, so we, so with the, the hot box we bring up a transparent window that kind of covers the screen with transparent background, uh, which was all fine except on Linux when you have stereo views. So, we, you know, we started to run into some issues there. Uh, the option box sub items that was one of our early challenges, and we that was kind of good when we got past past that. It was a uh, bit of because we had to do the custom drawing and event handling there. Uh, we wanted to have tear off menus on the main menu bar on the Mac. That was a bit tricky. We ended up having to change the Qt code, which like we really didn't want to change the Qt code. Like we wanted to avoid that, but in certain cases it was. It was unavoidable. Uh, like I say, matching the motif layouts. Um, performance was an issue in some areas where we had certain windows that just are really, really dense, like with the, the number of widgets. Um, the QT for Mac 64 was, was kind of a work in progress when we were um, when we were like starting starting out, so that was that was definitely a challenge for us um, keeping up with that. Um, and like I said, we ended up changing the, the source code, even though we tried really really hard not to, but didn't succeed. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see if the the people from DreamWorks like agree with this this list of benefits that I've put up. Um, so, so one of the benefits for our customers is that they can now use Qt Designer, so they actually have a GUI to design their, um, their UI as well as like having scripts. So it means that people who are not like the TDs at, at film studios, people who are, are just like regular users who don't know how to program could actually like design, design UI. Um, also for, a really important benefit is that the customers get tighter integration with with their their own plugins and also third party plugins so before when they were using qt it was you know kind of you know separate event loop kind of thing and it was it was kind of like everything was sort of off to the side and now they can integrate with the, the main event loop so uh, so that's better uh, modern look and feel, like, and, you know, just, like, we were able to do, like, the dock controls. Um, a, a few places we've added, like, text completion, which is really nice. Um, more dynamic UI. So I think this is kind of, we're just at the start of this, but, you know, it used to be that if you if you had one of those scripts like I was shown before, like if, if you did anything like slightly wrong, the whole UI would just kind of collapse in a heap on the floor. And now it's like a little bit more forgiving. Um, so so that was that was good. Um, in the end, like uh, the interface ended up being more stable on Qt. Like we we have stability metrics where we crack where we track like the the number of crashes in the in the product like sort of an automated crash reporting and actually like Maya on Qt ends up being like slightly more stable than before so that was that was really good uh, Mac 64 so a lot of customers wanted that so that was good um, and in addition like some people like to to customize 
the version of Maya, like sort of the look of it. And like before, like we only supported all these like crazy outdated icon formats. And now, you know, we just have, you know, a more normal standard set of formats that we get kind of for free with QT. So it just makes it a bit easier. Sometimes people had to like really jump through hoops even just to create their icons. So yeah, not good. Um, so the benefits for our own team were, you know, obviously it's good that it looks more like a modern application. Um, just the regular developers who are not in the, the UI team just have a more complete set of widgets. Or if they need something new, they, they know that they can ask us and, you know, we can do it much more easily than having to implement it like four times. So, so that's really good. Um, Internally, like our product designers can also make use of, of QT Designer. So, um, in fact, for the development team, we only used it in, in one window in the end. But um, for the product designers who don't necessarily know how to program, it's kind of, it's a useful tool for them because they can kind of mock up exactly what they want the UI to look like and say, make it look like this, even if we end up you know, redo it in scripting or in, you know, whatever, like just direct QT API, whatever, so. Um, and for us, like the big benefit, well, like one benefit was that we got to delete just reams and reams of code, which was really nice, like all the old platform code. Um, and like we end up with code that is a lot easier to maintain and just fewer platform differences and for us, that means that we can kind of focus uh, more on providing like the tools that our customers want rather than focusing on having to deal with like all these like just platform differences and stuff like that. So, so that's really nice. Um, so I have a few examples of kind of, this is like the sort of before and after picture. So this was, you can see with, with the one on the right, we have, um, that we sort of developed this new dark style to the UI, um, which was we ended up kind of subclassing the uh, the Q style class, I think it was, um, and you know I think you can kind of see the difference. Like like now it just looks a lot more modern, and you know we added we were able to add like more functionality. Like this has more tabs, and you can. You can go and find an image and kind of select colors from that image and, and stuff like that. So it's pretty nice. Um, similarly, with the, the shaders UI, before we had this like crazy interface where, you know, we have, you know, scores of materials that people can pick from, and they had to like just scroll down all these sections, and it, it took forever to kind of find the one you want. Um, like now in in the new one, we have we added all these categories, and you just like click on the category and you know kind of see the things in that category. And it's kind of hard to see up here, but there's like a text box here, so you can just start typing in the name, and then it finds the material. So, so that's pretty nice. Um, so, I think that's pretty much all I had to with the the presentation and so let me just switch over and uh do the demo i don't know how much time i have left is uh loads of okay all right um so i have to preface this with um this is definitely a developer demo and not like, you know, we have application engineers who are like really practiced at, at demo Maya who could like make characters and create explosions and, you know, fur and all that kind of thing. And this is like definitely the, the spheres and cubes demo. But the point of my demo is not really to show how to use Maya, it's really more about these are the UI features in the product. So, excuse me. Um, 
So it was kind of interesting what Jean was saying before about using uh, the Q main window, because I think that's something that we really want to do. Like we, we pretty much used kind of the standard Q main window layout. So we have um, tool, toolbars and like dock widgets, so you can kind of grab things and undock them. Um, and, and just with the, the kind of around the, the center sort of layout. So you have your, your 3D view in the middle. I'm going to make a torus because that's kind of my favorite primitive. Um, so one thing to point out that we did was um, on the, if I could just show that. Like on the right here, we have the, these tabs, and it was interesting what what someone was asking about with the with the uh, the dock widgets because here we sort of have an example which sounds really similar to to what he was saying where um, we need to kind of resize the the dock widget because the like the attribute editor is just like a really different size to the channel box. This is where you kind of edit your object properties. And like our, our users are very um, jealous of every pixel on the screen. I mean, like you look at Maya and it's kind of, you know, it's very dense in terms of, in terms of using like all the, the screen space in the window. Um, users get really unhappy if you use up too much space between things. Like so, you know, like showing this and having like a huge blank space beside it is just that just doesn't fly with people. So um, we had to. We actually ended up changing the, some of the the Qt code, like just to to be able to kind of make this smaller when we need to. So that was that was kind of interesting. Um, so the other things I wanted to show. Where, so this is one of the the marking menus that I was talking about. So you, it's like a the context sensitive. So like I right click on an object, and I can go into select vertices mode, or I can go into object mode. Um, and let me see if I can kind of show. Like if it's kind of hard to show, but the. The idea is you kind of use a gesture to to select the the different marking menus, and you have the option to either just use it like a regular menu, or you can just do a gesture, and then it, it picks that item from the menu. Um, and the hot box, you hold up the you hold down the the space bar, and I know you're all thinking, oh my god, what is that? So. In Maya, we actually have multiple menu sets because, you know, who just wants to have one menu set? So you can switch between, like, animation. You get, like, a different set of menus. Um, dynamics, you know, we have, like, all these different... Oh, sorry, that was surfaces. So dynamics, you can, you know, go and make some gravity or, you know, make some particles or whatever you want to do. So then the... The hotbox actually gives you oh, interesting. It gives you those same menus, like just in a in a different form. Um, so for Maya users, they really like to um, drive the, the UI really fast. They don't always want to have to go up to the main menu bar, so. You know, they use hotkeys, they use the hotbox, like, they're just always wanting to really, like, you know, drive the, the UI really fast. And it was kind of interesting for me because, um, like, we, we had to decide, like, what order to do the functionality in. And one of the things was we sort of made the decision and said that, well, the you know, since everything that's on the hot box, you can do it a different way. We actually made it later in the project. But then, like, for a lot of people, it was like, you know, 
you can't take that away from me. So we actually had to kind of bring it forward a little bit because that's kind of their main way of driving the UI. And they actually, it's actually hard for them to remember like how to use it without that, which, which I thought was like really interesting. Um, so what else, what else? Just look at my crib sheet here. Um, so, so I'll just show the the materials UI. Um, so this is what I was talking about with the the text completer before. So you can just start typing. And it shows you like a list of like the mental, mental images, materials that you can use. Um, so just being able to do things like that is really nice because that would have been prohibitive before, before we had QT. Um, the, the color shader, so we actually had like a, we have kind of a quick look one, like where you can just get, you know, your, adjust your colors really fast and then then we have like a the more involved one where you can you know choose from different ways blend your colors like like do all these different things um, so. So I think that was all that I really wanted to draw people's attention to in the UI. So if anyone has any questions about about the port or about what we do in Maya. Any questions? Uh, when, when porting to, to Qt and when implementing your style, uh, did you roll that? on your own or did you use the style sheet engine? Um, we tried doing things with style sheets and we weren't able to get exactly what we wanted. So we ended up kind of writing our own subclass. Of cute style or yeah. of all the widgets? Um, like not for everything, but like certainly for colors and for, for some things we had, we had to do that. Let's shake hands then. Sorry? Let's shake hands then. Oh, you did, you did the <laughs> we same? We did the same, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we are still using our large of, of the application we wrote is, is, use, uh, is based on the style sheets. Uh -huh. But uh, there are kind of strange limitations. Yeah. yeah. I think someone so had advertised. Band, yeah. yeah. Someone had advertised it to, uh, to the product designers. Oh, you're going to love QT because we'll be able to change the colors and everything really easily. And then, you know, when it came to it, that, that part was like a little bit harder than we envisaged. But yeah. uh, Good to know we're not alone out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But in the end, people really liked it. I mean, it, so it was good. Hi, yeah, I just want to ask you about the, uh, how you manage complexity and usability. It's not really a QT question, but just how you uh, interact with your users. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so one of the ways that we do it, we'd actually like to do more in this regard. Like one of the ways is just through the different menu sets that we have. So they're kind of split up by different areas of the product. And actually, like there's probably not many users who would use all of Maya. Um, the, most people, you know, some people would be focused on like the modeling tools. So, you know, we have like the modeling menu set, like the polygon modeling. Um, some people might be focused more on like the special effects and do like just be doing dynamics work and things like that. So. So part of it is, you know, just having having these different menu levels. Um, we also have like the context sensitive menus. So, so these menus kind of change depending on what kind of object you have. So, if you have um, 
like if you've created cloth, for example, it knows which tools, you know, you can use on the cloth. So you might, you know, you can kind of paint on different like weight values for things and stuff, stuff like that. So, so that's, that's kind of a really important way. And we have in the attribute editor on the right, we also have like some context sensitive menus in, in some parts too. Um, which seems not to be working, but never mind. Ah, there we go. There's one. So, for example, you can um, you can look at the individual properties and create expressions for them, or you know, set a, a key on something like an animation key. That's the keyframe. Um, we. It's a little bit hard to show on this screen resolution, but there's actually some more tools that are hidden where you can kind of choose between different layouts in the program. So people can kind of easily switch to a diff like different choices of views, like maybe animation curve editor and the perspective window, depending on what task they're doing at that one time. So. Is it what, sorry? Yes, like every, pretty much everything in Maya is kind of customizable. So um, like the marking menus, there's a marking menu editor. And um, so we, we don't encourage it, but people have actually have all the scripts in the product. So sometimes people just go in and directly change, change the scripts of the interface as well. But we have, you know, we have editors to, to do the same thing. Um, the the shelves at the top, like people can also kind of customize things. So you can, I don't know if I can remember the, I don't know if I know the command sequence on this one, but you can basically like drag things onto the shelf um, that you use frequently. You can also um, bring up the script editor and kind of, you know, just type a, a script and then put it on the shelf and stuff like that. So it's it's extremely customizable. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I had a question about: uh, Do you use a QGL widget for the main rendering interface, or is it something else? Yes, we do. Yes. And then a lot of third-party plugins are also there for Maya, like Renderman and that sort of stuff. Do you also su support Q plugin, or is everything done through Mel still? Um, we have most things go through Mel. Um, you could use. PyQt, or we also have um, our own API as well as that, um, and you can also use, use Python as well. Does does that answer your question? Well, Not yeah, you don't really use plugins or anything like Office or the huge plugin frameworks that do loads of dynamically. No, no, we don't. Um, and actually, like one thing to note is that we didn't implement every single widget that's available in, in Qt, we, we just have kind of a subset of, of the widgets that are available. Um, but people can use Qt Designer and then kind of bring things in and, and connect them and stuff. Oh, I have a question about testing, how, how you have done the testing of this whole stuff, so. Yes, so that's a really good question actually. Um, so we have, um, just for Maya in general, on every every time anyone checks any code in, there's like over a thousand. I think it's over. I think it's up to like 17 or 1800 tests that run on every check-in. Um, so every every time there's a check-in, we do an incremental build, and then there's like a whole set of tests that run. So when we when we did the merge back to to the main line, there was you know we had all the tests passing, except for, I think there was about 20 that went passing, so it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, sort of, shall we push the button and say, you know, let's, let's do it. It was kind of a, a, a big decision. Um, but it, it's, you know, like one of, the, one of the developers always said, like, well, just the fact that we can actually bring up the Maya interface is a big test in itself because, you know, it's because there's so many scripts behind it. Like, it's, it's, 
executing so much of, of the, the UI code. Um, but we did also like add some things, like there's a, a test that brings up all the windows, so it just kind of goes through them in order kind of thing. So, and we, we'd like to do more um, testing. So for example, we looked at Squish and things like that to do more detailed testing, like, our, like so far our tests are, um, we'd like them to be a bit more intensive than what they are, I would say. So. Yes, are you using the, the Qt Wacom tablet support? Are we using Qt? Qt Wacom tablet support? I don't Qt think, tablet event? No, I don't think so. Not aware of that anyway. Um, maybe you could demonstrate quite quickly the, the menu option that you worked so hard oh, on to implement. Yes, yes, yes. Well, not me personally. Um, I did like a very small amount of coding on this project because I was mostly kind of the product manager. Um, so this, so that was what we were talking about. So every Everything that we bring up has like an associated, or well not everything, but most menu items have an associated set of options with them. So, you know, if you, like you can see how long some of the menus are already. So if, if all of these, you know, you had to have like a second one that's like, well, you know, duplicate special options, like, the, A, the menus would be too long, and B, it would just drive everybody crazy, so wasn't really an option. So then we we have like this this square where you can like if you click on that instead of just clicking on the menu item then it brings up all the options. So uh, you know it's again it's kind of just to manage the complexity of, of the interface. So can I ask as well, uh mm -hmm. are there I think there are other products from Autodesk I worked with uh -huh. AutoCAD before. I don't know if that exists anymore. Uh, is this a yep. Qt product? Are you going to do, work? Are you working on that in your development office? Or are you going to port that as well? And so, in in the media and entertainment division, uh, like so, when we started using Qt, like we were among the first people in the company to be using it, and then gradually, um, there was kind of we'd hear from more and more groups within different parts of Autodesk using it. Um, in our division, there's also the Mudbox product, which I think Ken mentioned this morning, which also uses Qt. So, and, and there's some others like spread around the company. Like, I'm not entirely sure which ones I can say are using it or not using it. So, because um, they're in like other divisions to us. So, but yeah, it's been it's been used quite a lot now. It's becoming quite established at, at Autodesk. So. Thank you, Myra, very much. Thank you. Sorry, I should say as well that um, if you go down to the demo pods, you can actually see Maya in action if you want to kind of play with it and stuff. It's on, on one of the machines down there. And feel free to come and ask me questions if you see me. Okay, thanks. <laughs>